everybody. Um, appreciate y'all joining us here on our first ever uh, webinar. Um, just a little bit of background. You know, we do lots of different presentations for different groups, uh, rotary clubs, um, other different organizations all over the watershed and had a bunch of them actually scheduled coming up. And of course, those are now canceled as we we're all uh, working remotely. Um, and we got to thinking that this could be a really good opportunity to, instead of canceling all of these education opportunities, to actually do more of them. Um, so we've been practicing with Zoom um, internally here with the staff, and uh, this is actually our first shot at doing um, an educational outreach type presentation uh, with the public. So uh, bear with us for a little bit. Um, we've practiced and I think we've got it down pretty good. Um, but what we're going to do is um, I've got a presentation here put together and the good part about doing something like this is that I can share my screen and talk about some of the uh, web links and show you how to go through some of the different um, online features um, that some of these different uh, governmental organizations have that are really, really good uh, tools to help you understand water quality and water flows within the whole river itself. And today we're gonna to be talking in particular about the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Um, so just to get started, I'm sure most of you know who we are, but Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, we are a nonprofit environmental organization uh, established in 1994. So we've been around for 26 years protecting um, this river that provides a water supply to 5 million people. Uh, we have over 10,000 members, three office locations, headquarters is in Atlanta, and then we have satellite office in Gainesville and another in LaGrange. And looking at the entire uh, basin or um, Chattahoochee, um, Flint, and Apalachicola River system, here in the blue shaded area, this is the Chattahoochee River, starts north of Helen in Georgia, flows down, forms the Georgia Alabama border here at West Point Lake, and then flows down all the way into Lake Seminole. And then the brown here is the Flint River, starts at Hartsfield Jackson Airport, flows all the way down, meets the Chattahoochee River here at Lake Seminole, and then Woodruff Dam is what uh, impounds both of those two rivers, and then what comes out of that dam is the Apalachicola River. So it's just a confluence of the Chattahoochee and Flint River system. So a lot of people don't quite understand how the Chattahoochee and the Flint interact to form one river that flows down into Florida. Now looking at the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, which is what we wanted to talk about here today, that is forms right there at Buford Dam at Lake Lanier and flows for 48 miles into the city of Atlanta. So this little segment right here, the Chattahoochee itself is 435 miles long and this national park segment is 48 miles of that. So looking at the National Recreation Area, it was established in 1978 by Jimmy Carter. Again, it flows for 48 river miles and that entire 48 river mile stretch from bank to bank is national park jurisdiction. And then within uh, those land units around the national park, you have um, different parts are federally owned. That's part of the national park. Some is local city or county or state. And then a lot of it is also um, privately owned. Uh, the headquarters is at Island Ford in Sandy Springs. And of the federal um, portions of the land adjacent to the 48 mile stretch, 10,000 acres of that is a, a green space that's provided with 18 National Park Service units. And again, there's additional city and county parks. I'm about to pull up a map to show all of that. Um, the park itself is very heavily uh, recreated. So of that 48 miles and the 18 different park units, 3 million people visit this national park and um, makes it, I think it's the 43rd most recreated or most visited national park in the entire country. And of those 3 million people that visit the CRNRA, uh, 1.3 million of those people actually get on the river and participate in water-based recreation. So that's you know, fishing, kayaking, tubing. These are people that are getting on the river and coming in contact with the water. That's a lot of people every year that's getting onto th this part of the Chattahoochee River. And 
for the fishermen out there, uh, Trout Unlimited has named this 48 mile stretch as one of the top um, 100 national uh, trout fisheries in the entire country. Which is really cool that the city of Atlanta has such a vibrant uh, trout fishery right in our own backyards. And to talk a little bit about that fishery, um, going downstream from Buford Dam into Morgan Falls and Roswell, uh, we have a lot of um, rainbow trout that are stocked every year. So uh, the rainbows are all stocked because the rainbow trout, they spawn in tributaries. So the only cold water in the Chattahoochee is coming out of the dam and only the main stem of this river is cold enough to sustain trout. So when the rainbows try to go and spawn, they are actually uh, swimming up into the warmer tributaries. They're laying their eggs and they don't survive. So we can only see uh, rainbow trout in this part of the river that are um, stocked um, by uh, Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Um, but it's a wonderful fishery and a great way to get kids out to enjoy the water. Uh, the brown trout, however, we've learned over the past 15 years or so that these, these fish used to be stocked in the CRNRA, but they are main stem spawners. So they actually lay their eggs in the main stem of the river itself, which is cold water, and that allows them to actually reproduce in the Chattahoochee River. So we haven't had any brown trout that have been stocked in over a decade. And that really makes this um, fishery special because we have this naturally sustaining population of brown trout. So the way that um, you can look at this geographically is the Chattahoochee River is the second southern furthest um, fishery in the entire country that has trout in it. There's another um, fishery in Texas that's actually a little bit further south that has trout and it's also a tailwater. But we are the furthest southern fishery in the entire country that has a self-sustaining population of trout. Um, and these fish are just absolutely gorgeous. So this predominantly happens from Buford Dam down to Morgan Falls. Downstream of Morgan Falls, we have a delayed harvest stretch where um, DNR will stock the rainbow trout during the summer or during the um, winter time. And then during the summertime, we actually get um, striped bass that'll come up from West Point Lake and they'll come all the way up to Morgan Falls Dam. So um, we have stripers in this stretch, we have uh, shoal bass and um, spotted bass, largemouth bass. So the, this 48 mile stretch really does offer a lot in terms of fishing opportunities all year round. And it also offers, of course, a lot of paddling opportunities that we'll um, pull up a map here. So I'm going to um, show you some different links through this presentation. I'm going to pull them up on my screen while I share the screen, um, but we're also going to share all of these links in the comments section of the Facebook um, page so that you can um, reference them later. And all of these links, um, you know, it's very easy to, you know, bookmark it on your laptop or on your phone so that it's very easily accessible because um, these are things that I use almost on a daily basis. So looking at the National Park Service map, um, okay. So here is the uh, CRNRA National Park Service homepage for the Chattahoochee. Um, of course, I'm sure you've all heard that the park itself is now closed because of COVID-19. Um, so that includes all of the park units and the waters itself, so the river itself. Um, but looking at the map, so this map right here shows the entire 48 mile stretch of the river. So zooming in, this starts here at Buford Dam and then it shows all of the different park units as you go downstream. And it also gives you all the different codes for hiking, uh, boat ramps, restrooms, um, so this is a really good tool to use to try to plan any types of trips that you may be going to the CRNRA. And a really good function is that these pink numbers are mile markers. Uh, so the 348, that means that that's how far away you are until it reaches the Gulf of Mexico. But each pink dot is a mile as you're going down. So you can look and find all of the different boat ramps 
and plan a trip if you want to go for you know, four miles or eight miles or 12 miles. All of that can be planned by looking at these maps and finding your different units that have the uh, takeout points. And it also will show uh, different uh, city or county parks. Like here you have Gerard Landing, that's the city of Roswell Park. Uh, looking at the um, green different sections here, this green shaded part, that's federal land. These tan parts right here, that is uh, local owned, uh, local government owned land. And then these areas is private property. So you'll see, you know, houses and things like that all along these parts that are intertwined with all of the different um, government owned lands. But this map right here is a really good thing to have if you haven't seen it. Um, it shows the entire 48 mile stretch all the way until you get to the bottom of the park, which ends right there at the confluence of Peachtree Creek. For many years, your last takeout point was right here at Paces Mill. Uh, but about four or five years ago, the city of Atlanta, who owns this part right here, actually opened a very um, not well known park called Standing Peachtree Park. That's right there at the confluence with Peachtree Creek, where you can actually, instead of um, your only option taken out is at Paces Mill, you can take out right here at the confluence of Peachtree Creek. The only problem is that you have to park kind of up here by the road and then carry your boats up and down for about 100 yards. Um, but that is an option to um, put in a takeout right there. So this map doesn't show that, but everything else is pretty much up to date. Okay, so going back to our presentation here. I wanted to show a quick video because I got this presentation broken out into two main uh, categories. One is the flows in the river. So how much water is coming out of the dam coming from the tributaries and flowing through the CRNRA and how that affects how people can fish, how they can um, paddle, wade, and recreate in the river safely. And then I also want to talk about water quality, in particular E. coli, and how you can uh, go online and measure and find um, real-time information on um, the E. coli levels and how you can use that to also uh, plan your trip. But before we get started, this is just a one minute long video that's put together by the Army Corps and the Park Service and uh, talks about the flows in the river. And then I'm going to take you um, to the, US, the Army Corps website and show you how to check all of the um, projected flows that are going to be coming out of the dam. Chief Ranger Chris Arthur with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'm standing just below the Buford Dam. The current in this river can change very quickly. We want you to know a few things before you come to the river. Know the times of water releases and be prepared for changes. Know to look for signage along the river. Know that you must wear your life jacket while in this section of the river. Remember, your safety is our concern. Know about the flow before you go. Thanks, Ranger Chris. I'm National Park Service Ranger Marjorie Thomas, downstream at the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Safety is important to us as well. Be cautious. Don't go in the water if the river is high or fast moving. Be a buddy. Always bring a friend with you to the river and let others know of your plans. Be aware. Exhaustion and even hypothermia occur quickly in cold water. Be safe. Never jump or dive into the river. Remember, the Chattahoochee River is your river to enjoy, but be safe, your life depends on it. Okay, so you saw the, the uh, video of the uh, water being released from the dam at Buford. Um, Forever, there's been the, um, the phone, local phone number that you can call and you can get the recording that'll tell you the next you know, 12 to 24 hours of projected releases. Um, it's much easier to go online and look at um, the projected releases that they have posted. So going to that website is this. 
So the Army Corps, and you can only bookmark it straight to this homepage for their hydropower generation schedules. This includes all of the uh, hydro um, generation Army Corps dams in Georgia. So you have Alatoona, Buford, Woodruff, all of these different dams. Uh, what, of course, we're going to look at is Buford Dam at Sydney Lanier. So you can pull that up. And this is all of the projected releases for today. Um, and you can scroll here to get some of the um, previous days. You'll notice that tomorrow's is not on there yet. And the reason for that is the Army Corps doesn't make their release decisions until they get pretty close to that day. So I looked yesterday and the releases for today were posted at like five or six o'clock, something like that. So you're not gonna be able to see and look for next Tuesday on what the Army Corps um, projected releases are because they don't know that. They base their decisions off of um, the most recent uh, weather forecast and all of the different elevations and the different reservoirs downstream from here. So you can look, you know, five or six o'clock and you should be able to see what it is for tomorrow. But looking at this data for today, what it does is it gives you hour by hour and then the generation that's coming in in megawatts. What this means is you got your conversion table over here to convert your megawatts into cubic feet per second. Cubic feet per second is what we use to measure river flows. So for all morning from midnight all the way up until about 11 o'clock this morning, they were doing seven, seven megawatts or 700 cubic feet per second. That's your base flow, minimal flows going through the river. Um, and then at 11 o'clock, you'll see that they start to do a, a major release at 67 megawatts. And that equates to about 6,500, um, excuse me, that equates to about 6,500 cubic feet per second of flow. That is a typical generation release in um, normal operations for the core. If they're going to release for power generation, 67 cubic watts is generally what they're gonna, going to release um, going down into the CRNRA. But you, what you'll notice here is at four o'clock, they open it up to 127 megawatts. That is the dam wide open. At 12,500 um, 12, cubic feet per second, that is peak flows. That is basically, they cannot let any more water out of the dam without flooding areas in Roswell and Sandy Springs. So this is your max release flows. And what, why we're seeing these max release flows um, coming on and off is because Lake Lanier is still above full pool. And we'll look at um, the lake levels when we get to the USGS gauges. But this is a really good way to um, be able to tell exactly when the core is gonna be releasing on an hour by hour basis. So this is coming out of Buford Dam. The other link that you're gonna to wanna to have bookmarked on your phone is Georgia Powers, that is if you're going downstream of Morgan Falls Dam. So Georgia Power, theirs is not quite as helpful because they don't do an hour by hour um, projected releases like the Corps does, but you can go on Morgan Falls website and you get the real time release of uh, river flow at 7,290 cubic feet per second. That's um, also a lot of water coming out of uh, Morgan Falls. And then they'll have um, their projected um, schedule, which is generally goes until midnight and they're gonna be operating two units. So that means we're gonna see pretty heavy flows coming out of Morgan Falls uh, for the rest of the day. But going back, The next one we want to look at is the USGS gauges. Now looking at these gauges, these are operated by the um, United States Geological Survey. Okay, I'm going to go to the home page. So this home page has all of the federal water flow and water quality gauges all across the state of Georgia. And they are categorized here by river basin. So we've got Savannah River, we've got Altamaha, St. Mary, Swanee, and here Chattahoochee. And the way that these gauges are listed out is it starts geographically from the headwaters and then flows all the way down to uh, the Apalachicola River 
down here at the bottom. So what we are interested in here, let's look at Lake Sydney and Lanier. This gauge will give us the current uh, elevation of Lake Lanier. So right here, we have 10,072.49 feet above sea level. And what that means is that Lake Lanier is still above full pool. The full pool elevation is 1071, so down here at this bottom line. And one thing that has really been affecting the CRNRA and our flows for the past year and a half um, has been the elevation of Lake Lanier. So one cool thing that you can do with um, with these uh, gauges is you can designate your own time frames. So what I want to do is look at the Lake Lanier levels since January 1 of last year. So that's going to crunch those numbers. And then here, we can create our own presentation quality graph. Okay, here we go. All right, so right here, January 1st, 2019, this goes up till right here today. Um, and then the full pool elevation is right here between 1070 and 1072. Um, what's really interesting is if you look at March 2019, that's this part right here, and then March 2020, you'll notice that we have very similar rain events um, leading into March last year that we had this year. Both years we were uh, over five foot above full pool elevation, and actually last year was the third highest that Lake Lanier had ever been uh, since they built that dam. And this year was the second highest that Lake Lanier has ever been since the dam was built in the mid fifties. The only time out of these two years where the lake got higher was in 1964. So we've had a lot of rain in the headwaters of Lake Lanier. And that has meant that Lake Lanier has been very, very full. And as a result, the Army Corps does these massive releases trying to drain that water out of the lake to get down to this full pool elevation. So when you see something like this, as this lake is dropping, or this line is dropping the lake levels, and what we see here as well, that is the core with the dam almost open, wide open, trying to drain that water down as quickly as possible. And that also means that the flows in the CRNRA are extremely unsafe because we're looking at flows that are, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand cubic feet per second. We'll talk in here in a minute about what those numbers actually mean. But I monitor the lake levels very closely because when we are above this 1071 level as we are today, we can expect very high flows coming from the dam as the core is draining that down and that creates very unsafe conditions in the CRNRA. Now that is looking at the lake level itself. Let's look at some of these different flow gauges downstream of the dam. So the dam itself is this link right here. And this shows what we saw right here, where from midnight down until 11 o'clock, we had minimal flows coming out of the dam. So very low levels at 700 cubic feet per second. The Corps said that they were gonna start their first generation at 11 a.m. So looking at this graph, that's exactly what that shows. Here at midnight, they went down to very minimal flows, held that all morning, and then at 11 o'clock, they opened it up and did a, ma a big release at 67 megawatts or about 6,500 cubic feet per second. So you can see that here on the dams gauge. And then as we go farther downstream, let's look at this gauge here. So Chattahoochee River at Norcross, this is the Medlock Bridge gauge. So on this gauge, you can see 
as the the core led off of those releases and did very minimal levels the flows here dropped way down and they just opened it up at 11 o'clock so an hour and a half ago is when we saw those releases starting coming back out of the dam again and that takes to to get to um, Medlock Bridge is about four hours. So here we've got a window of about another two and a half hours of these low levels before these levels start to go back up again. So if I was planning a fishing trip, for example, I could look at this gauge right now and when I fish, I basically want levels to be below 2,000 cubic feet per second. Um, so we can expect to have these levels below this 2,000 CFS for about another three hours. And then we're going to go peak right back up again, like we did in these past couple of days, going all the way up to 9,000 CFS. And looking at these um, different flow levels, uh, the Park Service has requirements for the outfitters that put uh, people on the river. So canoes and kayaks, for example. So an outfitter is not allowed to put somebody on the river um, in a canoe or a kayak if the river is above 3,000 CFS. And that's a really good number to use when you're planning a trip to go out onto the river. Basically anything above 3,000 cubic feet per second, those flows are gonna be so high that it can be dangerous. They can push you up against a fallen tree, for example, and it's gonna be very difficult for you to get yourself out of that if you are in a canoe or a kayak or a tube. So anything above that 3,000 mark is generally pretty unsafe to be on. So, um, and that's the level that the Park, Ser Park Service will not let those outfitters put people on the river at. Um, and for fishing, like I said, you know, once you get above 2,000 CFS, those flows are getting pretty high. And it makes it, especially if you're fly fishing, pretty difficult to um, try to be on the river and present your fly, um, that sort of thing. So. Another thing I wanted to point out on this table here is on the home page, you get the water temperature and you get this flow and you get the gauge height. But if you go farther up here and you click on all of these parameters, you hit go, you're going to get a lot of other parameters that come in. For example, you get precipitation. So this is a great way to uh, monitor uh, local rain events looking at um, the closest gauge to your home, you are also going to get turbidity. So this is a measure of the water's clarity. So a lot of fly fishermen you know, are very interested in knowing how clear that water is because the clearer the river is that day, the better the fishing is gonna be essentially. Um, it's very hard to present a fly or a bait if that water is super muddy. And you can get real-time information it's right here at 2.4, and this is measured in nephilometic turbidity units, which means nothing, but uh, at 2.4, that's very, very clear water. Um, my personal preference is anything above 10 is where you're right here at this level is where that water is going to be so muddy that I'm not even going to bother um, making the trip out to the river. I'm going to wait for that river to clear up um, because at 10, you're getting fairly muddy out there, but at 2.4, we can expect the river right now to be very clear, and this part of the river is pretty low, but we know that big slug of water is coming because we looked at this projected release, and we also saw that release coming um, from Buford Dam, which we know will be there in about two and a half hours. And, you know, I would just encourage you to go through this entire list of this U, the USGS gauges, uh, tributaries are on here, as well as uh, different parts of the main stem. Again, the higher up you are on the list, the farther you up on the river basin. And if you, you know, are somebody that goes farther down the river, say at Morgan Falls, you can click here and you see, you see the releases. This is the flows coming right out of Morgan Falls Dam. Again, anything over 3000 CFS, you don't want to be out on there in a canoe or kayak here. We're at 5,200 uh, right now coming out of Morgan Falls. So that's pretty much off limits um, for pretty much anything getting on the river. Um, so this is a great way. You know, we have so many people that go out to the river and then just see it's raging. Um, they've gone through all the trouble putting their boats on their car.
cars and doing the portage and then they get there and they realize the water's just too much. This is something you can just pull up on your phone very quickly and know exactly what those flows are. And I would also encourage you to, when you are on the river, look at what the flow is. So if the flow, if you're on the river and the flow is 1200 CFS, for example, that's a great time for you to either make some notes or at least some mental notes to say, okay, this is, this is what the river looks like at 1200 CFS. The next time you're out there, if it's at 2000 CFS, look at it, know what that flow is so that you can mentally know what these different flow rates are. So when you're looking at it electronically and you, know, you see 5000 CFS, if you've never seen the river at 5000 CFS, that may not mean too much to you in terms of what you know what it's going to look like. But if you've seen the river before and you've made those um, mental connections visually on what that river is at that, um, that number, over time, you'll be able to look at these graphs and visually being able to, um, vi or mentally visualize exactly what that river condition is just by looking at these numbers. Um, may take a little bit of time, but it's a great way to really learn the river and know exactly what's going on while you're just sitting in your home. Okay. So let's go back. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the issues. So I want to, right on time here, I want to spend about 30 minutes um, doing some screen sharing and looking at some of those online functions. And again, we're going to share those links in the Facebook page itself or in the comments. Um, again, I would encourage you, especially now while we're all at home, you know, spend some time playing with those links, getting to learn them, um, bookmarking all of the different um, sections that you go to in the CRNRA on your phone so that you can have them very easily accessible. Um, and especially not just the locations that you like to go to or that you're planning to go to, but bookmark the ones that are upstream from you. So as you're on the river, let's say you are at um, Medlock Bridge, you can bookmark the flow gauge at McGinnis Ferry that's what, about 12 miles upstream from you. And you can tell when that water hits McGinnis Ferry, you know when that water's coming down to you to um, make any decisions about speeding up or trying to get off the river. Okay, so one of the things that has really been a bad problem has been bank erosion. So all of these flows, again, you know, last year and this year, these lake levels have been so high that we've seen pretty much unprecedented uh, releases coming out of Buford Dam as the Corps is trying to drain that lake down, get it to full pool elevation. One of the main problems, one of course, has been we haven't been able to get on the river. Uh, regardless of the virus right now, we haven't been able to really get on the river for the past several months because uh, these flows have just been so high and, un and unsafe to be out there with a few isolated cases where you can kind of catch it like you probably could have caught it today at Medlock Bridge if the park wasn't closed. Um, but for the most part, we haven't been able to get out there. And what the flows are also doing is causing massive amounts of riverbank erosion. So we're seeing a lot of trees falling into the river, we're seeing a lot of this um, sloughing and erosion of the banks themselves. And there's really not a whole lot we can do about it, unfortunately. Uh, riverbank restoration is very expensive. It's a very involved process. And for example, on this stretch right here, if you were to go through the full process of doing a full scale restoration, which would involve um, bringing out heavy machinery, uh, reshaping this bank, armoring it, and then planting it with uh, the proper vegetation, you're looking at roughly $300 to $500 a linear foot for that property owner. Um, there are some grants available, but it's very, very little, and they are very competitive. Uh, so we do get a lot of calls from people um, that own property on the front of the river saying, you know, we've got all this erosion. Um, what can we do about it? Who can come out and fix it? Um, what kind of funds are available? And again, there are some funding available, but it's very, very um, few and far between. They're very competitive. So a lot of this, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do in the immediate future. Okay. So looking at, so those are the flows and some of those key numbers that you want to keep in mind as you're going to the river downstream of the dam. Um, we also get a lot of questions and a lot of calls about E. coli. Um, so E. coli is the best indicator of 
um, fecal contamination of the river itself and river safety. We can actually calculate what is the likelihood of you contracting an illness by coming in contact with the river water based off of the E. coli levels. And we have a partnership with the uh, National Park Service and the United States Geological Survey. It's called Bacteria Alert. And this is a program that's been going on since 2000, where it started where we were collecting samples almost on a daily basis and looking at the E. coli levels and then trying to compare that to a level that, or a perimeter that we can read in real time. Because the problem with E. coli is we have the technology, we can collect a sample, we can grow it, we can count it, we can tell you what the likelihood is of you contracting an illness by touching that water. But the fastest time available is 18 hours. So basically what we can do is tell you you shouldn't have been on the river yesterday. And that's really not much help to anybody that was on the river yesterday, because you're just now finding that out today. So what the Bacteria Alert program does is it tries to give us, and it does give us, information in real time. And what we've done with um, what the United States Geological Survey did was we collected these samples at McGinnis, or at Medlock Bridge and at Paces Ferry every day, collected these samples, and then compared that to a surrogate, and which turned out to be turbidity, where we can measure, and they built this model, right? So the model looks at 20 years of data of E. coli levels and turbidity values, which turbidity, we're talking about that. We're talking about muddy river water. And we have this 20 years worth of data in this model that says, if the river is nice and clear, it looks like this, we are meeting all of our safety standards for um, EPA's recommended values of recreation. Our E. coli levels, if the river looks like that, the river is actually very clean, very pristine water. Our level of pathogens is very low. We are meeting all of our safety standards as recommended by EPA. So that's the good news. The bad news is, is when we get these heavy rains, we see our turbidity values go up, but we also see our E. coli levels go up. And that's um, the E. coli that's being washed in by stormwater runoff from um, septic fields, from aging sewer lines, and from dog parks and, and other animal poop gets washed into the river. And what we've learned is that we can actually look at, hold on, what these turbidity values are. Right there. What the turbidity values are and estimate the E. coli counts. So with our historic data, we've learned that when, for example, the turbidity at Medlock Bridge right now is 2.5. Our 20 years of data tells us that when the turbidity is at 2.5, our E. coli values are very, very low, around 34. So we can use that to issue uh, or um, to estimate the uh, risk value in real time. So right here, let me refresh my screen. So 12.15. So the last um, water quality measurement came 30 minutes ago, and we have the real time estimated level of E. coli in the river is very, very low. And these are broken out into the top of the park and the bottom of the park. So this one here, at Medlock Bridge is closer to the dam. We have very low levels and downstream, this is right at Pace's Mill, right at the very end of the park next to Canoe Restaurant and the Lovett School. Um, we have higher levels because we're seeing that our turbidity is actually a little bit higher down there, but it's still very, very low levels. Now let's say we get a heavy rain that comes in this afternoon and we see these turbidity levels go way up then this historical data has told us that we also are assuming that the E. coli levels are going up as well. So then, you know, in pretty short order, you're going to see this estimated risk value, this box will turn red and say that your estimated risk value is high if this turbidity goes up and hits a level that the historic data tells us that we're not meeting the EPA standards. So this is a a great tool as well, not only checking the flows before you go out, but checking the bacteria alert program, you can um, estimate your risk value for coming in contact with that water. And of course, 
even if your risk value is low, we do not recommend drinking the water. Um, you want to minimize your contact with water. If you have any open sores or cuts, that increases your risk. So try to avoid um, water coming in contact with those open wounds, covering them, um, avoid swimming if that's the case, that sort of thing. Um, but um, and the park will not close if this estimated risk value gets high, but we do recommend that you be very cautious if you are gonna go out on the river while these, um, when this box is turned red. And again, use exercise, extreme caution, limit your exposure to the water, limit, you know, if you touch the water, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your ears, your nose, that sort of thing. I think we're all becoming a lot more cognizant of that type of thing in this day and age, um, that that also applies you know, once we're through um, the virus crisis, while you're out there, you still want to use common sense, have hand sanitizer with you, um, and that will um, keep your your risk at the lowest that it possibly can be. All right, so let me go back again. my mouse is going crazy. There we go. Okay. So real quick, um, I'm about at my time here. So I don't wanna go out any, any farther um, than we need to, because we do wanna take uh, some time to do question and answers if anybody wants to stay with us. Uh, but some of the other monitoring programs that we do, we have what's called our Neighborhood Water Watch Program, where we have volunteers that go out to 180 locations every single week, collect samples, deliver them to our uh, one of our three Riverkeeper laboratories. And then we do the full analysis for E. coli, turbidity, and all these other parameters. Um, which helps to complement the bacteria alert program and other governmental monitoring programs that are happening because a lot of these monitoring programs are not happening on the tributaries as they're coming in. So this helps us identify polluted tributaries, polluted parks, um, and help educate the citizens um, about recreational contact with those waters. But it also helps us identify where the pollution hotspots are that's coming into the river and how we can help reduce those uh, levels of E. coli from coming in. Uh, one of the major culprits, of course, is sewer lines, and we find a lot of sanitary sewer spills, particularly with the so-called flushable wipes you see hanging on these trees here and on this manhole. Basically, all the fats, oils, and greases go down into the pipes, and they mix with these wipes and clog the sewer line that overflows, goes into a tributary, goes into the Chattahoochee River. So we're able to monitor these tributaries to find these spills and get them stopped so that they're not flowing into the CRNRA where we have 1.3 million people recreating on, every, on it every year. Uh, here's the link, I'm not going to go to that one again because again, I'm short on time. Uh, we also look at a lot of construction sites uh, where we get a lot of this turbidity coming in, a lot of this mud, trying to make sure that everybody's putting up their silt fences and their construction exit, their sediment basins. Um, we do the same pollution watch over industrial yards like auto salvage yards, chicken processing plants, asphalt manufacturing, anything that's outdoors that has exposure to storm water. We keep a close eye on those things. Again, our largest source of pollution coming into the Chattahoochee River is not a factory. It's not a wastewater treatment plant. It's storm water. It's because we see very, very good water quality when it hasn't rained in the last couple of days. But if we get that heavy rain, that water, that rainwater is washing from all of these different um, land units and all these different land areas, which wash it into the river. So Riverkeeper, we're doing our best to look at where those pollution sources are coming from and working with those uh, industries and property owners to make sure they're putting up as many of those controls as they can to filter out that runoff. Uh, we also have a huge trash problem. So okay, here, this is, I took this picture last week, or no, no, this was two weeks ago. Um, at um, Don White Park. This is Don White Park here looking up. This is 400. Lots of trash coming in. We were really excited for this Saturday. We had Sweep the Hooch event coming in. Last year we pulled 50 tons of trash out of the um, 
out of the river. Of course, now that has been postponed until August. Um, so if you uh, weren't signed up for the Sweep the Hooch event, I would encourage you to go on our website, um, watch us on social media. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we will be able to proceed with Sweep the Hooch. Uh, it's over 50 different cleanup locations um, in August. And we are also now working on trash traps. We do not have any up in the CRNRA yet. We, these are prototype designs that we have installed in Proctor Creek and a couple other tributaries downstream, but we are right now fundraising to install additional trash traps on tributaries upstream in the CRNRA, creeks like Big Creek that, um, and Swanee Creek, those two in particular, have a large trash um, contribution factor coming into the CRNRA. So we're looking at installing these traps that actually funnel the trash into the traps um, and then we can go clean those out before it makes its way into the river. And we are also working on a project called the Chattahoochee Aquatic Sensor System Integrated, what we call CASI. Um, so some of us here on Riverkeeper staff have been working on our own technologies to develop remote water quality sensors. This one is installed in the Guinness Ferry uh, to help complement the uh, USGS gauges. So those USGS gauges are fantastic. They're very expensive. It costs the federal government upwards of $50,000 every year just to operate one gauge. So we, um, they can't put um, gauges on every part of the river. So we are developing our own technology to try to measure some of these perimeters in real time um, where we think that they need to be put in. So this one was recently put in at McGinnis Ferry. Uh, we're still perfecting this design. And once that's perfected, we're going to be able to put that out online so you can look at the USGS gauges um, for where you want to go. And hopefully if there's not a USGS gauge for an area that you're interested in, we'll be able to install one of these CASI devices in that area so that we have tabs all up and down the river system. And of course, we're out there patrolling um, on a regular basis looking for buffer violations, illegal dumping, we're taking water samples, we're measuring dissolved oxygen, all these different things. Um, so some of the things that you can do is, as I mentioned, fats, oils, and greases down the drains and wipes, they wreak havoc on our sewer lines, they clog them, and that puts sewage in the river. Um, so any way that you can keep all that stuff out of our sewer lines is going to help keep sewage out of the river. Um, conserving water at home. We have a lot of resources on our website about uh, water conservation inside and outside of your home. Um, dog waste, as I mentioned with stormwater runoff, uh, human E. coli is a lot of what we find in the river, but a surprising amount of what we find also is dog waste. So people not picking up the dog poop, you get that heavy rain, washes its way into the river. We've seen a lot of that through some recent DNA analysis projects. And picking up litter. So, you know, Picking up litter out of a parking lot keeps it out of the river because in the next heavy rain, that bottle that's sitting in you know, the Kroger parking lot or in the Walmart parking lot or whatever, that rain's gonna wash it into a storm drain, it's gonna go into a creek and then make its way into the river. So picking up litter any way that you can. And then also participating in um, solo based trash cleanups or once the um, virus crisis is over, join us on one of our organized cleanups. We have at least two per month. Um, and of course our big one is Sweep the Hooch. And we have lots of volunteer opportunities. Aside from that with our Neighbor Water Watch program, we're always looking for additional volunteers to collect our water samples, deliver them to our drop-off locations or laboratories. We have a lot of resources on our website about that as well. And we need as many eyes and ears out there as possible. Um, the people that are fishing on the river, that are paddling on the river, that walk the trails on a regular basis, they know what looks normal, they know what doesn't look normal. So you are the folks that are out there that we really need paying attention. You see something, somebody cutting down a tree on the bank of the river, you know, or you see a color in the river that doesn't look right, or a color in a tributary that doesn't look right. We have a report a problem on our website. Um, you can do, report it through social media. You can call us. We have all these different functions. Um, even if you're not sure if it's a problem, let us know. We will check it out. We will work with the park service and uh, the local governments to make sure that if it is a problem, we get it fixed. So that's the end um, of this presentation. Um, you know, I hope everybody's staying safe out there. Um, I'm really looking forward to the park opening back up and the flow's going down. We can get back out there, go catch a trout, go paddle, um, 
down some of these parts of our national park. Um, I've been on the CRNRA since 1985 I, when I was four years old and I grew up in Gwinnett County. I've never, never stopped going out on this national park. It's really special in my heart. I take my kids out there. Um, so I'm really proud to be part of an organization that gets to help protect it and um, really appreciate you guys joining us. I think we can open up for questions. Um, if you were interested, if you are not a member, you can join uh, with a membership at Chattahoochee.org. And we are fundraising right now, in particular for the new aquatic sensors and the trash traps going into the CRNRA. So if you were interested in supporting either of those projects, you can text CRK to 41444 and it'll respond to you with a um, link that you can go on and support these projects. So with that, I will open it up. Okay, um, actually this is Jess. Um, I'm the technical programs director. Um, so we're gonna do, I'm gonna open it up for about 10 minutes of questions. Um, what we're gonna do is um, you guys can raise your hands. So at the, if you escape out of the full screen on Zoom and you go down to the bottom bar, um, there's, a, there's a little thing that says mute, there's a thing that says stop video, there's a little icon that says invite. And then what you want to click on is participants and you'll see the names of all the participants here and at the bottom there's a little box that says raise hand. Um, so if you want to go ahead and raise your hand, um, Julia can unmute you and then you can ask your question to Jason and he can respond. The other way to ask a question is through the chat function and some of you have been using that during that. Um, so two, two icons over is the little bubble that says chat. If you click on that, um, you can send a message um, just to Jason or to everyone and we can get we can get your questions answered. So I'd like to open it up now. It looks like we already have one question in the chat um, from Chuck Young. Um, he says, how might all this great data get distilled to make it more accessible to the average river user? Yeah, and that's one thing that I've been thinking about here that I'm confined in my house. Um, and that's one of the things that I you know, wanted to, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this presentation is to try to get it out there. And um, there are these, these great resources out there that a lot of people don't. Uh, are not aware of. So we're going to be um, posting this video itself, um, video on our Facebook page, so people can go back and look at it later. Um, but I'm um, hoping that we'll be able to um, do some more resources on our webpage and get all of these links and maybe some, you know, how-to um, guidance or tutorial on our webpage to, to help people navigate it a little bit easier. Because, um, you know, they're not the user-friendliest of websites, but they're they're pretty good um, in terms of usability. And uh, we'll try to get that out on our website here sometime in the near, near future. Well, so no other questions? Um, well, again, you know, our website is chattahoochee.org. Uh, my information, of course, on there, Jess's information is there. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, right now, actually, email is going to be easiest because we're not at the office to answer our phones, but um, reach out via email and uh, we'll be happy to work with you or answer any questions or help you out in any way that we can. I'll also add, um, this is Julia, that we can email out any and all links that were in the PowerPoint rather than just posting them in the chat since the chat will close down as soon as we end the meeting. Um, but if you registered for this Zoom and you gave us your email, we can send it to you that way as well. So just wanted to let everybody know.
And with that, you know, I'm not seeing any other questions. Like Jason said, feel free to reach out to us on um, or at chattahoochee.org. All of our emails are listed there. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the webinar. But thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, hope to talk to everyone soon.